In the last video, we looked at some popular verse, in particular, Adam Laybound. Now, just looking at the first line of Adam Laybound, you notice something we're familiar with from Old English. Adam Laybounden, bounden in a bond. It reminds you of alliterative verse, but the problem is, is that the poem doesn't continue using that alliterative style. And so you're forced to ask the question, if this is just alliteration, that figure of repetition based on consonants, in other words, a ornament, or if it's essential to the meter itself. Now, clearly in this case, it's not, but you see this everywhere, echoes of the alliterative line. All that grain me graveth green, or in a whale white as whale's bone. A whale white as whale's bone, a grain in gold that goodly shone. It's almost as if we're looking at the borderline between a popular verse that uses alliteration for ornament, and that kind of alliteration we'll find as well in Shakespeare, and alliterative verse which includes alliteration as part of its meter. But they're distinct. Take, for example, Ikata Bord, also known as Blow Northern Wind. When you look over the stanzas, and notice now we're talking about stanzas, which makes it distinct from Old English, you see what appears to be an alliterative line, but also certain features that are coming clearly from French poetry, not only the stanza, but also the rhyme. He caught a board in boor bright, that sully samely is on sight, menskful maiden of might, fair and fray to fond, in all this worldly to one, a board of blood and of bond, never yet in us none. Lusa more in bond. And then we get the refrain that starts it on the top. Carol, just like a Christmas carol. It begins with a refrain. That's the blow northern wind. And then after each stanza, that refrain repeats itself. You also notice uh, how alliteration and a potential alliterative meter completely falls away. And we get moments that appear very French-like. Like in the stanza describing what she, his love, looks After like. describing her body parts in a blazon-like fashion, we'll see lots of blazons in the Renaissance where a, the, the body of the person you love is itemized. We move into metaphors where she's described first in terms of minerals and then in terms of flowers. And here is the anaphores, of course, heo, 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 she, heo is coral of goodness, heo is ruby of rightfulness, there's an alliteration, Heo is crystal of cleanness and banner of beauté. Heo is lily of largesse. Heo is parwinkle of prowess. Heo is sulcicle of sweetness and lady of loyalty. And then we get the refrain, blow northern wind. You can hear how alliteration is still happening. Is this alliterative or is it the echoes of alliterative tradition that never died? And then also there's these amazing allegorical figures, as if we're now entering the world of Charles of Orleans or even Chaucer, where the lover is calling on love to get some control over his knights or knichtes, sighing, sorrowing, and thought. To love that leaflick is in land, he told him as he could understand how this and uh, this beautiful, gracious person he's in love, hath hent in hand, has seized him in hand, on her that mine was. And her knichtes man so sought, like her knights are following him around, sighing, sorrowing, and thought. These moments of alliteration point to a certain hybridity on the part of Middle English poets, where two traditions, one Old English, strictly Old English, the alliterative verse, and new French influences start to combine. Now, can we find a alliterative verse akin to Old English? 
Yes. Now we call it the alliterative revival. Now let's look at this proper alliterative verb. Swarthus, naked, smith, smothered with smoke, drive me to death, they're driving me crazy with din of their dentists. Switch noise on nichtes ne heard man never. What knave ne cry and clattering of knocks that commaded congens crying after coal, coal, and blowing their bellowings that all their brain bests. They're blowing into the bellows that their heads are bursting. Hoof, puff, saith that one, half, paff, that other. They spitting and knacking, they groan us together, and holding them hot with her hard hammers of a bull hide been here barm, fellas. Their shanks been shackled for the fire flanders. Heavy hammers they striking on a steeled stoke. Loose bass, las, das, rout in bureau. Switch doleful a dream, the devil it to drive. The master longeth a little and lasheth a less, twineth them twain and toucheth a treble. Tick tack, hick hack, tick it, tack it, tick tack, laspus, laspus. Switch leaf they led in, all clothe them ours, Christ them give sorrow. May no man for bren wathers on nicht and his rest. It's a loud poem, isn't it? And yes, it seems to be filled with onomatopoeia, which gives it the sound effect of the noise that's keeping this man from sleeping. But the rules of the what we call the literary revival are part of the fun of this poem. Now, you already know your rules for the versification of alliterative verse in Old English half lines, alliteration on the first two feet of the A verse, and then alliteration on the first foot of the B verse, and then there's always a strong syllable that's not alliterated in the B verse that gives it some uh, variety to the poem. Here you can have the first A verse, or the half line before the caesura, can include three alliterations, and also you notice that the entire line can be alliterated. Swart, smeked, smiths, there's caesura, smothered with smoke. If we used the alliterative notation that we learned in Old English, we would describe this as a, 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 a. There's no free strong syllable without alliteration. And there's three feet, not two, like in Old English. And then let's look at the next one. Drive me to death, Caesura, with din of their dints. B, B, Caesura, B, B. That would be utterly impossible in Old English. Uh, in the alliterative revival, you find that non-alliterated stress syllable, that X, not in the fourth foot, like in Old English, but everywhere. Like here. They spitten and yak and gnackin. They groan us together. X, A, A, X. Or even the master longeth a little and lasheth the less. X A A A A. Do you see where the stress non alliterative syllable moves around? Also, unlike Old English, you can find extended alliteration where alliteration doesn't stop on one line, it will continue on to the next line. You find that, for example, here. Twineth them twain and toucheth a treble. Tick tack, hick hack, tick it tack it, tick tack. You'll also find examples where alliteration occurs only on a half line. So each half line is alliterated differently. Here's two, for example. Their shanks been shackled for the fire flundrous. A, A, B, B. Heavy hammers they strike in on a steeled stroke. Let's just give them new letters. 
C, C, D, D, and D. You also find, for example, cross alliteration, where one alliterative syllable crosses into the other half line and vice versa. Two different alliterations are shared on both sides of the half line. For example, here, Hoff puff saith one half path that other. There's the caesura, a b x, a b. See how the alliteration crosses. Three kings has an even easier one. From the noise that it and notice in alliteration, alliterative revival, you can also um, alliterate pronouns and grammatical words. It was the night a b b a we also find what is called superabundant alliteration that's multiple mixed alliterations occurring along the line in describing the leather aprons or bottom fellas of a bull hide been here barn fellas a will be for the B, B for that H, we have the caesura, and then we return to the B, and we introduce a new letter, C for fellas. So, of a bull hide been here, barm fellas. And then we get their shanks been shackled for the fire flundrous. And in that, we have a new letter for sh sound, D, D. But we're returning back to the F sound, fire flandres, C, C. And then we return again to the H sound, heavy hammers they strike in on a steel stroke. And in this case, it becomes B, B from that first one. And then a new letter. E, E, E. Of a bull hide been here barm fellas, their shanks been shackled for the fire flunderous, heavy hammers they strike on a steel stoke. Sir Gowan the Green Knight reflects all of this variety. Sithen the siege and the assault was seized at Troy. You have S, 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 and then a new letter right here. Troy, A, A, A. Caesura, A, X. The borough Britain and Brent to bronze and ashes. Borg and Britain and Brent to bronze and ashes. B, 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 X. It also is put into a stanza. And at the close of that stanza, we also find rhyming. Now, the stanzas of this period are called stock and wheel stanzas. They're usually made up of a stock, which is the main part, and then a wheel, which is a shorter part, making the stanza mixed verse. So here is the stock. This is the wheel. And it also includes a little extra called a bob. So it's a stock and wheel with a bob. The stock can be of any length. It is all alliteration. The bob is always one line. Is it two syllables? Is it one foot? As it alliterates always with the next line, with ween, where roar and wreck and wonder. And also, you can also alliterate grammatical words in the alliterative revival. Maybe it's syllabic because it also rhymes. Win, in, and sin. So it's a mixture of French and Old English. And then the wheel is made up of four short rhymes, three feet or six syllables. It may be alliterated from the bob, and it's also rhymed from the bobs. A, B, A, B, A. All right, guys, don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that notification bell.